In this video, we'll begin to look at the four types of macromolecules. There are four major types of carbon compounds or macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Carbohydrates include sugars and polysaccharides and are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Lipids include glycerol and fatty acids, phospholipids, and steroids, and are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and sometimes phosphorus. Proteins are made up of amino acids. These contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides that contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and nitrogen. We'll look at carbohydrates first. All carbohydrates contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. We see this in the glucose molecule where we have twice as much hydrogen as we have carbon or oxygen. The function of carbohydrates is energy storage. It's also structural. We'll see examples of both in this video. Let's first look at the simplest carbohydrates, the monosaccharides, simply meaning single sugars. The general formula, as it is for all carbohydrates, is the 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. If we look at all of these monosaccharides, we'll see that they all have a formula of C6H12O6. It's just that the atoms are arranged differently. This is because they're isomers. They have the same molecular formula, but different structural formulas. There are two forms of glucose shown here, alpha glucose and beta glucose. And the only real difference is in the placement of the hydrogen and the hydroxyl groups. You can also see fructose and galactose. And one of these stands out as being quite different structurally, and that's the fructose because it's a pentose or a five-sided sugar. The others are six-sided sugars, so you can easily recognize fructose. Monosaccharides join together to form disaccharides, di meaning two, so two sugars. These are all disaccharides, sucrose, maltose, and lactose, and they all have the same formula, C12H22O11, and as a result we know that they are molecular isomers. What is different is in which monosaccharides make up each of these disaccharides. Sucrose is made up of glucose and fructose and you can tell which one of those two sugars is fructose because if you look carefully you'll see that this one has five sides. It's a pentose sugar. Maltose is made up of two glucose molecules and lactose is made up of glucose and galactose. Each one of these pairs of sugars is joined together by a glycosidic linkage. How do disaccharides form? Well, they form through the process of condensation synthesis. Another name for condensation synthesis is dehydration synthesis. And as both names imply, the way that these molecules are formed has something to do with water. In fact, water molecules come off as bonds form between these sugars. Here's how. In condensation reactions, you have two or more monomers that are going to be joined to each other. And in order to do that, you have to remove a hydroxyl group off of one and a hydrogen off of the other. Same thing over here. We're going to form another bond here. Wherever a bond forms, a water molecule has to be removed. The result of these three monomers having two water molecules removed is that you get a polymer made up of three, the three monomers and you have two water molecules formed as well. When a disaccharide forms, the same thing happens. A hydrogen comes off of one and a hydroxyl group comes off of the other and we get water forming and we also get a glycosidic linkage forming between the two sugars. When a disaccharide forms, we get a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, but it isn't a perfect 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. What we mean by that is that if we were to actually add up the number of each type of atom in two glucose molecules, we would find that it doesn't add up to C12H22O11. It actually should add up to C12H24O12. So we seem to be missing two hydrogens and one oxygen. Well, that's the equivalent of a water molecule. And in fact, if we factor that back in, back in, we'll see that this formula for maltose makes a lot of sense. Would we still call it a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio? Yes. 
because we can account for where those two hydrogens and oxygens have gone. They basically had to be removed in order to form the bonds between the two glucose molecules to form maltose. All disaccharides form as a result of condensation or dehydration synthesis of two monosaccharides and all of them result in glycosidic linkages. So here we only have the one example of glucose plus glucose forming maltose but we also know that you can take a glucose molecule and join it to a fructose molecule to make sucrose and glucose molecule plus a galactose molecule will give us lactose. What else is required to get these reactions to happen? Well, we need an enzyme. So for example, if we want to form sucrose, we need the enzyme sucrase. Likewise, we need lactase to form lactose, and we need maltase to form maltose. Notice that each of the enzymes ends in ASE, and that's a good indicator that we do have an enzyme. Most enzymes end in ASE. Uh, the nice thing about the name is it also tells you which reaction it actually is controlling or catalyzing. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the same enzyme can catalyze the reverse reaction. Why do those arrows go both ways? Well, it's simply because reactions are reversible. So if you have a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule and there aren't very many sucrose molecules around, the sucrase will actually bump into the glucose and fructose and convert them into sucrose. If you were to leave that in a closed system, the sucrase would bump back into the sucrose and convert it back into glucose and fructose and you would basically reach equilibrium. And this is the type of thing that happens in a test tube and it's the type of thing that chemists are very interested in. Biologists aren't really that interested in equilibrium because it doesn't really happen in quite that way in living things. In living things usually what happens is that the relative concentration drives the reaction in one direction. If you have a lot of glucose and fructose molecules and not very much sucrose, sucrase is going to be bumping into the glucose and fructose. But the sucrose is not going to remain in the same system. It's going to be moved around to another location in the cell. It's going to be used in another reaction. And so it's never going to accumulate. So the sucrase would drive the glucose and fructose reaction towards sucrose and not the reverse reaction. On the other hand, if you uh, ate a big sugary candy bar full of lots of sucrose, uh, you would have a rush of sucrose in your digestive system and the digestive enzyme sucrase would break down sucrose into glucose and fructose. But again, you would never reach the kind of equilibrium you find in a test tube because in the digestive system, the glucose and fructose would be absorbed into cells lining the digestive cavity and right into the bloodstream and be whisked far away from where the digestion of sucrose is taking place. And so in that case, in the digestive system, sucrase would be catalyzing the reaction in this direction and the glucose and fructose because they're never accumulating means that the sucrase is not actually going to bump back into them and convert them back to sucrose. So it'll just continue to break down sucrose into glucose and fructose. The opposite of condensation synthesis is hydrolysis and we just saw an example of how that works. Sucrose can be broken down into its subunits. We start with the polymer and we want to break it down into its subunits. What do you think we need? The clue is right here in the name of this type of reaction, hydrolysis. If you guess that we need to add water back, you're absolutely correct. A hydrolysis reaction is the opposite of a dehydration or condensation synthesis reaction. So if we add the water back, we are basically going to get the three monomers because the hydrogen is going to go to one of the atoms and the hydroxyl group goes to the other. Likewise over here from the other water molecule a hydroxyl group goes here and a hydrogen goes here and we get our monomers. So we can actually go back and forth between polymers and monomers and of course what we need here to drive that is an enzyme. Here's an example of that taking place in our digestive system. If we eat some starchy food, the enzyme amylase will catalyze the breakdown of starch into its subunits. Starting first, really all it can break it down to is maltose. So if we had this chain of four 
glucose molecules and we're calling it starch, it can break that down into two maltose molecules. We need another enzyme to break down maltose and I'm sure you know the name of it because we've already talked about it's maltase. But we're really here only talking about breaking this one bond right here and for that you need a molecule of water. To break each of the other bonds here, each of these other glycosidic linkages, we're going to need a subsequent uh, water molecule as well but we're not showing that in this particular example. Polysaccharides are long chains of repeating subunits of simple sugars. They may be used for energy storage or as building blocks and as you probably guessed they're built by dehydration synthesis and they're broken down by hydrolysis. Here are some examples. These little hexagons are glucose molecules and in the case of starch and glycogen they're alpha glucose molecules. Um, they have various branching patterns. Starch comes in a couple of variations. You can have amylose which is uh, unbranched. You can have amylopectin which has a branch uh, here shown. It has some branching and then you can have glycogen which is a storage form of uh, carbohydrates in animals and it's actually got a lot of branching. There's one branch off the main chain and then that one has another branch so we call this highly branched. Starch is simply formed from the sugars that a plant makes through photosynthesis and the plant is storing its excess sugar for when it needs uh, more energy for a burst of growth. It's not storing that starch so that an animal can come along and eat it, although that is what happens. Uh, glycogen, on the other hand, is actually uh, the way that animals store uh, excess glucose and that glucose isn't made through photosynthesis, it's ingested and we have a limited capacity to store glycogen. It's stored in bulk in the liver and in the muscles but once those two sinks for glycogen are filled we actually cannot store any more glycogen and we would begin to convert the sugar into fat and we have sort of an unlimited capacity for storing fat. The structure of polysaccharides are cellulose and chitin. Cellulose is found in plants and cellulose is made from beta glucose and as a result it has a quite a different structure um, than either of the other two polysaccharides we've looked at. Cellulose is actually a building block and it's what we call dietary fiber. We actually don't digest it and the plants don't use it for um, energy. They tend to use it to help to build the structure and the rigidity of the plant. Um, animals also can use polysaccharides for structure and the most notable is in the arthropods. Their exoskeletons are made of chitin which are also structural polysaccharides. Getting back to cellulose, cellulose is digestible by some animals but it's not digestible by humans because we lack the necessary enzyme to do that. Even termites which eat right through wood and a lot of cellulose seem to be able to digest the cellulose but in fact it's not they who are digesting the cellulose but the microorganisms that live in their gut. Same thing with cows eating grass. Let's take a quick look at the difference between starch and cellulose. If you look at starch made of alpha glucose you'll see that all of the sugars are oriented in the same direction and the easiest way to tell is by looking at location of these oxygens. They all are on the same side. In the case of cellulose the oxygen location alternates because the molecules of beta glucose are flipped relative to one another in their structure. Small changes in the position of atoms in alpha and beta glucose result in dramatic differences between starch and cellulose both in their structure and in their function. And while we have the enzyme to break this bond, we don't have the enzyme to break this bond. Let's do a reality check. Pause the video as necessary.
How would our world change if humans suddenly evolved the enzyme to digest cellulose? That's one to think about.